Well, it's that time again. Time to pick up your board and catch away the latest waves in sales pipeline growth and development from the Jedi Knight himself, Matt Hines. I've always wanted to be a Jedi Knight. <laughs> I, I gotta favorite, have some. Yeah, my favorite movies growing up, Star Wars for sure. Oh, wasn't everybody. Into the Brotherhood or whatever it's called, the, the Jedi oh, Knight. I've been Silver Surfer. I've been the Guardian of the Galaxy. You always come up with something new, but Jedi Knight might take the cake. That might be my favorite. <laughs> so thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today on Sales Pipeline Radio. Excited to be here again, as we always are, live every Thursday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific. Glad if you're joining us for the first time. Thanks very much for joining us. Hope you enjoy the present uh, the broadcast today. For those of you listening that have been with us before, thanks again for joining us again. Always humbled by the, the folks that are engaging with us both in the live show that we do on the Sales Lead Management Network as well as through our podcast on the iTunes Store and Google Play. You can check out every past episode if you want to catch up, uh, not only through the podcast, but also at salespipelineradio.com. Each week, we attempt to feature some of the brightest minds in sales and marketing with a focus on B2B, those that are uh, both executing as well as creating some of the tools, strategies, uh, and everything else that's helping to make us create more scalable, more predictable, more efficient uh, sales and marketing pipelines. And uh, excited today to have joining us Paul Tashima, who has a long history in the B2B sales world, has spent uh, quite a bit of time with Eloqua and Oracle, Rogers Communication, and is now the co-founder and CEO of Nudge Software. Paul, thanks very much for joining us today on Sales Pipeline Radio. Thanks, Matt, for having me. I'm, I'm pumped to be on the show. Awesome. Well, I mean, you guys are doing some really awesome stuff at Nudge Software. I want to get into that. Talk about a little bit sort of your background, sort of where you've come from on, on, on the B2B sales and marketing side and sort of how that came together a little over three years ago, I guess, when sort of Nudge was born. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it really started way back, to your point, with, with Eloqua, about 14 years ago when Steve Woods and I started that, that company up in the marketing side of the house. And I think through that journey and, and working with marketing and sales execs, we saw time and time again how... Uh, the best salespeople did this incredible job managing relationships in their network and uh, used that as part of the reason to get into a deal, to help move a deal along or help close a deal. And we wanted to really help salespeople today, especially in this modern world of thousands of like connections and followers, to use their network better uh, to close more business. And that's where we founded Nudge. And I really love what you guys are doing. I mean, there's, I mean, clearly there are relationship management tools all over the place. Some people see that as part of what CRM does. I mean, a lot of people use LinkedIn and LinkedIn Sales Navigator. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of how Nudge is different and sort of how you guys aren't just reinforcing and communicating where relationships are, but, but leveraging relationship strength to help find the strongest path to deals, strongest path to velocity within target deals you're going after. Talk a little bit about the importance of that as a differentiator in in driving more efficient interactions with your prospects. Yeah, you, and I think it starts off with, by the way, LinkedIn is a, probably a fantastic business network and certainly will never be replaced. But I think one of the challenges that's been created from it due to its own success is that connections today on LinkedIn don't always represent a true relationship. And I think sales professionals that I talk to time and time again are saying that that is actually a challenge. And so by us focusing on actually tracking the strength of relationships uh, by tying into the communications that matter, like email, calendar, and phone. We can then provide sales professionals, sales executives, the ability to see who actually does have a good relationship at an account uh, or with a buyer that they're trying to engage with. And as you know, 80% of all B2B buying cycles are started with a referral. And as a rep, you always want to be the first in or be brought in through a trusted referral. It starts the relationship off on a really strong, strong note. Talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Paul Tashima, who's the CEO of Nudge. You can learn more about Nudge at Nudge, N-U-D-G-E dot A-I. Definitely encourage you to check it out and give it a test drive. Because I've been playing with this tool. I mean, I love it. I use it. I use it literally every day, and, and it, it gives me insights into not just my prospects, but also my network and where I should be play, putting attention. I mean, do you guys see this? Is, is this a social so selling tool? Is this a referral tool? Is this an ABM tool? Is it unfair to categorize it? Like, how do you guys sort of place that into some of the some of the categories of focus for a lot of B two B marketers today? So that's, that's a good question. I think we have two parts to the tool. Certainly, one is for more a social personal network, almost like a personal CRM, and that's the free product that you can get. But the, the one that we've come out more recently, the B2B team product, is really focused on outbound sales. So certainly we've been bucketed under the sort of the ABM, ABS category of tools, especially for sales. And again, when you think about outbound and going to named accounts, you know, those accounts is much more about quality versus quantity and effectiveness versus efficiency. And so the idea that you can use AI, use relationships to help better position yourself in a large account 
is certainly where we're focused in delivering value. It's a great way to position it. And I think, you know, as a salesperson, I mean, it's sort of, you know, coming from a you know, sort of small consulting firm myself where I am the sales team, uh, you know, it's, it's enormously helpful. Talk a little bit about how this scales. I mean, if you scale this out to a broader sales team, I mean, is this a sales? I mean, I think you guys call this a modern sales platform. Is this something the sales team is bringing in? Is this something marketing is bringing in to the sales organization? Like, where's the primary entry point? You know, we have people that are in the sales side as well as the marketing side listening. Like, how do they bring this in? What's the opportunity? opportunity for scale across an entire sort of sales or marketing organization to make this effective? You know, I think that to be fair, a lot of times we're going in through the sales organization first because we do have the free product and we have 10,000 users on that. So they're already getting the chance to try out part of the value proposition uh, very quickly. And so we get brought in sometimes because we have 10 sales users at an account and then we get introduced to the manager or the director level who then we can show them the enterprise product. And more and more, we're seeing situations, I'm sure you are as well, Matt, where uh, an ADR team or an SDR team may report into marketing, and we may be brought in through the marketing side of the house as well because they are responsible for cultivating accounts and bringing them to a certain point that you can hand them off to a sales organization. And so I'd say sales to start, but we're starting to see more interest from the marketing side as well, especially in an ABM play. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that. I mean, think of the as more and more companies develop. Uh, you know, dedicated sales enablement teams, which sometimes come from the marketing team, sometimes come from within sales. But as that effort is focused on, you know, increasing efficiency of sales teams, you know, providing content tools, technology to, you know, not only provide more efficiency, but I mean, I think in your position, you talk about the strongest path to buyers. You know, are you seeing more marketers look at this? Is it from a sales enablement perspective? Is you know, do you see moving forward this as a, a bigger opportunity for marketers to embrace work they can do to more directly impact uh, sales effectiveness and conversion? I, I think so. And I think that if you even take a step out of nudge and just think about the marketer's dilemma, especially in the account-based scenario, right? You have a lot more of a move to a support function versus source of leads, right? These are named accounts. Salespeople are already engaged in some groups and some groups are less. They have larger buying committees. And so what they're left with is how do I make sure I don't over-target the people who are already engaged and focus on the influencers who aren't necessarily showing up at the meetings. And so they really need to get a better understanding of where the relationships are starting to build between a sales team and the account and where they're weak, where they're not doing well at getting penetration. And with a tool like Nudge, you can actually provide that data on a real-time basis at a contact and account level to a marketing automation system so they can really target the support function around key relationships that a salesperson's already building. And that's a very important thing to do in an account-based strategy. So I want to take a quick step back and, and, and sort of go a little back in the Wayback Machine. I mean, you started at Eloqua in, in September of 2000. I mean, and you were there for what, 13, 14 years. What number employee were you at Eloqua at that point? I was number three. That's amazing. So, I mean, you were literally, I mean, almost from the, you know, you were from the very start of Eloqua, just like you are obviously with Nudge. Talk a little bit about similarities of early stage companies. I mean, Eloqua clearly is a success story on a number of fronts, right? I mean, it has, has become, you know, one of the largest marketing automation platforms on the planet, a successful IPO, successful acquisition. But in the early days, you know, I'm sure that it was not quite that clear or quite that sure of a thing. Talk a little bit about, you know, what it's like to be back in an early stage company. Um, you know, you guys are well beyond employee number three at this point at, at Nudge, but, you know, what is it like to be at that early stage company? So what are some of the lessons you learned at Eloqua that you've been able to port over to your time at Nudge? Yeah, it's a great question, Matt. You know, I'd say that right off the bat, the key similarity is, wow, it's still a lot of hard work. You know, there is no magic bullet to making a startup successful other than working hard, thinking smart, and trying to, you know, outbeat your competition by hustling. I think that is the same, although there are probably more startups than ever today, but still that's there. I think there are some, some key differences, uh, aside from me not having to move back to my parents' house to live, which was what <laughs> happened in the Elko days. For us as startup entrepreneurs, second-timers, the one thing Steve and I have the luxury of is, one, knowing when we had need to ask for help and then know who to ask for that help. And that's because we did invest in our network through that 14-year journey at Eloqua. And so when we don't know how to do something or something's new, we can go to that network and say, hey, You've done or seen this before at least two or three times more than us. Can you give us a version that maybe would help us to get, get us going? And we never did that in the early days at, at Eloqua, and we never were smart enough to do that. And I think that's a big change. 
So a quick follow on that before we have to jump off to a break here. I mean, I think, you know, I've seen most uh, entrepreneurs that have done this multiple times have seen failure, right? I mean, failure is a part of that path to innovation. I've heard different schools of thought that say, listen, if you've been through a successful company and exit, because clearly Eloqua was, that that really set you up for the next thing. Some people say that, you know, actually going through the pain of having an unsuccessful company is more valuable. I could argue either way. And sometimes I think, that, you, know, you know, having people with both of those perspectives is part of that. And, and you mentioned Steve a couple of times, Steve Woods, who's your co-founder, one of the co-founders of Eloqua, fantastic thought leader in the industry as well. You know, what's your perspective on sort of having starting this again? Like, what are the experiences prepared you for success or at least best armed you for success moving forward? I think the part that's, that's maybe hard to understand if you haven't had a big success is that through that big success, there was probably many, many serious failures along the way. We were just lucky enough to get through those times that were pretty well close to almost dead failure. I think even at Eloqua, in the early days, I remember... In order to avoid paying rent, because we couldn't, we couldn't actually collect enough money from customers to pay rent, we had to sleep in the office, take turns so that the landlord wouldn't kick us out until we collected enough money. And, and that was as close to failure as we got along that journey and, and taught us, one, the importance to sell to customers, two, the importance to collect money up front, some <laughs> important lessons in SaaS that were early learned. And so I think that on the path to success at Eloqua, there were many more failures, serious failures along the way that we had to recover from. We were just one of the lucky ones who got through those enough to actually get to the finish line. I love that you shared that story, and I think that it's it's important. You know, anybody who's in, who's at a company that you know, even if things are going well, there's always things that aren't going the way that you want them to. You know, one of my favorite books from last year was Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, who's the founder of uh, and the chairman of the board at Nike. And then the book starts before he started the company, and it ends right before the IPO. And most of the book is chronically the many, many, many times the company almost died. <laughs> you know, they were almost out of money, or you know, just on the brink. Not just failures, but just things that didn't go the way that you want them to. And I think that is that is the entrepreneurial journey. And I and I. I Appreciate you being uh, willing to share a couple of those stories, and you know, even for those on the on the on sales pipeline radio here that aren't you know startups or aren't going through or aren't entrepreneurial journeys themselves, just to know that that's part of the process, even in the company you're working for in sales or marketing. That is that is the path. There are no shortcuts. Uh, the path to success in any startup, you know, the elevator is broken. You have to take the stairs, and sometimes the stairs are broken. So anyway, we got a lot more time to send here on sales pipeline radio. We've got Paul Tashima, who's the co-founder and CEO of Nudge. We're going to be talking a lot more about relationships selling relationship marketing, how to do that at a strategic and a tactical level. We're going to take a break, pay some bills. We'll be right back. Sales Pipeline Radio. Building a sales development competency is critical to lasting revenue growth. Learn how to grow your business and register for the Modern Marketers Workshop, Sales Development, the Essential Building Blocks for Revenue Growth a fully online interactive workshop on June 6th and 7th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific. You'll learn how to build a scalable, united sales and marketing engine to lead your organization toward your revenue objectives. Visit www.heinzmarketing.com slash workshops. That's H-E-I-N-Z marketing.com and register today. All right, let's pick it back up with uh, Matt and his guest. We did have a Twitter question come in. I don't know if you want to take that or not, but somebody wanted to know, since this is a program about sales pipelines, how long did it take for Eloqua to develop a predictable sales pipeline? That is a great question. I'm going to write that one down because I definitely want to have Paul address that. Um, you know, my, uh, I've got my perspective on that as well. Maybe Paul has the magic pixie dust that we have, that I have not found in the number of years I've been doing this. Paul, if you have some, I, I, I think you should shut down Nudge and just sell that because that is what everyone is looking for. So, uh, yeah, excited to have uh, Paul Tashima, the CEO, co-founder of Nudge. If you like what you're hearing, this is what we do on Sales Pipeline Radio. I hope you'll join us each week. We are live at 2.30 Eastern 1130 Pacific. Make sure you check out the podcast as well for all our past episodes on the iTunes Store and Google Play coming up in the next few weeks on Sales Python Radio. Next week, the first day of June, we have Carrie Cunningham and Terry Flaherty, two senior analysts from Serious Decisions. They're going to be talking to us about the new demand unit waterfall from Serious Decisions. It was unveiled last week at the Serious Decisions Summit. Lots of advantages, lots of improvements. One enormous caveat that I've given uh, on that on that waterfall that actually Carrie and Terry 
Terry agree with, and we'll talk about that next week. Followed by Grant Cardone. He's going to round us out uh, as we head into June, talk about how to 10x your results. Grant is a prolific writer, author, often controversial. We'll see what we can do to stir the pot a little bit with him. And then following that, we've got Daniel Gogger, who's the CMO at PFL. We're going to talk about omni-channel marketing, online, offline integration to get the results you want. But today, we're going to spend a little more time with Paul Tashima, who is the co-founder, CEO of Nudge, and spent 13 years at Aliqua. He was the number three employee at what became a publicly traded company and a uh, highly successful acquisition from Oracle. So, all right, Paul, so the question comes in, what did it take to build a predictable pipeline at Eloqua? I'm sure that you know you, you spent an awful lot of time uh, on the customer success and the product development side, product management side at Eloqua, but I'm sure that you know you were involved as well on acquisition and you know have some scars from sort of seeing that pipeline grow and create some consistency. What do you have to share from that? Interesting question because at that time, if you remember back then, you know, serious decisions maybe just come out with their waterfall methodology and and really this idea of an integrated sit marketing sales funnel had just started and we were part of that journey and helping build and put that and put a feedback loop on what works. And so I would say it took us a while to get to a point where we had integrated that as part of our overall process and we were driving innovation around it in terms of the sales pipeline. I will say that I'm not so sure we ever got to what I would call the truly 100% predictable pipeline. But we absolutely got to a point where at least marketing and sales were agreeing on the different elements of that pipeline, what was important, where we should focus, and where the problems were. And so for me, that was as much a win as anything because I think for that time, that was the biggest first step issue that most marketing sales organizations face. I don't know what you think, Matt, but that's kind of where we landed in that scale at 80, 90, 100 million in revenue. Well, you know, there's the there's the playbook, right? There's the things that have worked elsewhere. There's things that work in most companies. And then there's your company, right? I mean, I think, you know, if you read the book, you know, the hard thing about hard things, you realize that, you know, no matter how many times you read predictable revenue, no matter how many times you read good to great, you can read all the strategy and all the insight books you want. But figuring out that for your industry, your business, your moment in time is difficult. So I guess, you know, to, to, to round that out then, you know, take all that learning, all that success from Eloqua. Applying that to nudge, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of places where you are already have an advantage because you've done it, you you you've learned it, you have some of that playbook. But now you're in a different business with a different product, with a different everything. Those lessons aren't always immediately transferable, are they? That, that's absolutely correct. In fact, I would say that the biggest thing that Steve and I always check ourselves on is that what we learned 10 years ago or eight years ago doesn't always apply in this new world of modern sales and marketing. I mean, look at companies like Slack or Intercom where they've taken a very product-led go-to-market strategy and they're supplementing enterprise sales revenue with self-service revenue. It's a very different model uh, where you can land and expand with, you know, 10 sales seats or 20 marketing seats and then grow from there. And so I do agree with you completely that based on your business model, your go-to-market, your industry, it can be different. Well, and just to just to, to go further on this Twitter question we had, I think, you know, the behind that question might be, I don't want to infer what someone's thinking, but it might be like, when is this going to work? When is it going to be easier? I've had a lot of companies, you know, come to us and say, listen, once we have a couple more successful companies, once we get some case studies published, once we launch our 4.0 product, it's going to be easy. Everyone's going to be knocking down our door. And I have yet to find a business or an industry or, or a situation where selling is easy. I mean, I think the best situation, and I wrote about this on our blog a couple of years ago, the best possible selling situation that I have seen in an environment. It's a couple of years ago, the Golden State Warriors were just beating everybody, right? And I think it was maybe it was last year, the year before when they had the Super Bowl in town. And, you know, the Saturday before the Super Bowl, they had the Gold, the Oklahoma City Thunder were in town. And so it was a big game right before the Super Bowl, a bunch of celebrities in town. A friend of mine runs premium sales and uh, sweet sales for the Warriors. And you would think in that moment of time, he has the best sales job in the world. And he said it was incredibly stressful. Yes, we had great demand. Yes, lots of people wanted stuff, but we were still trying to get top dollar. We weren't just trying to fill sweets. We were trying to get people to buy food and beverage. We were trying to get them to get the mascot to show up. And as soon as every one of those games ended, the inventory was gone. So even in the best of conditions, selling is hard. And there is never a time that I've found where it gets easy or it gets automatic. You are grinding on a regular basis. And if you're in sales, if you've done sales, you know that there are things that can make your job easier. Inbound leads can make things easier. Market awareness can make things easier. You're a big, well-known company and it makes it so that people might answer the phone more, but you still have to get the deal. You still have to get people to sign. You still have to get someone who's distracted and busy to make a commitment. And uh, so I don't mean to discourage people. I think more just to share sort of, you know, from both Paul's perspective as well as what we've seen across, you know, multiple different industries and businesses. Uh, Look, you can create that pipeline. 
there's always going to be a level of challenge and difficulty in making that work. I'll get off of my soapbox. Let's talk a little more about Nudge. How about that? If, if, for those of you that are interested in learning more about this 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 great relationship selling tool, I definitely encourage you to check it out. Go to nudge.ai. That's N-U-D-G-E dot A-I. And you know, one of the questions I often get, Paul, from people that are, you know, whether they're using Nudge, they're using LinkedIn Sales Navigator, you know, they're getting buying signals, they're finding opportunities to engage, translating insight into action can sometimes be difficult for people understanding. Okay. Like, so I see that I should contact someone. I see that something happened in their business. Like how exactly do I reach out? Do I just call and say, Hey, I saw this. Do I call and use that as a way to sell someone? Like what are some of the best practices you've identified and that you guys evangelize at nudge for how to translate those insights into a next step and an action? That's a really great question. Actually, it's a question actually that we are right now working with a lot of customers on because it's very different from say a BDR perspective to how you use an insight where you maybe just want a high level mention something to show all you're trying to show in that situation is, Hey, I have actually spent some legitimate time looking at you and your company and your situation versus just blasting out a series of, of emails without a lot, without a lot of thought versus in the sales process when you're actually engaging where you actually have to provide context around the insight because you're not just now trying to say, hey, respond to my email. You're actually trying to show you understand their business. And so what we've actually developed is a series of playbooks that looks at different insight types, whether it's an exec change or an earnings announcement or an M&A event or a new product line, and then allowing that to sort of tailor by the role within the sales process because it is different. So those playbooks sound interesting. Are those are those available primarily to customers? Do you have those available up on the website as well? Yeah, right now they're they're with customers, but certainly we will be publishing them because we think that you know that type of content is fantastic for anyone to consume and also to create a feedback loop as other people develop their own playbooks against insight driven type sales activities. And so yes, the answer is yes. That stuff will be available soon, but right now we're working on them with customers. No, that's great. I think definitely look forward to checking that out. I think that is a big, um, it's a big gap for a lot of companies. And I think as companies not only think about how to do this, uh, you know, with individuals, but how to scale it, like, you know, what can they do to achieve that? All right. Well, we are unfortunately uh, running out of time already on Sales Pipeline Radio. I want to thank our guest, Paul Tashima, who's the CEO. Uh, and co-founder of Nudge. Again, highly recommend checking out their site. Check out the product. Give it a whirl. They got lots of great content on relationship selling as well. Check it out at Nudge, N-U-D-G-E dot A-I. We'll put a link to that in our show notes. Uh, speaking of show notes, if you want to hear a replay of our talk conversation with Paul, you want to share that with some of your colleagues, you can check that out in a couple of days at salespipelineradio.com. We'll have a transcript and sort of a highlights blog post featuring Paul and his comments today on HeinzMarketing.com here in a couple of days as well. Make sure you don't miss any future episodes of Sales Pipeline Radio via our podcast, Google Play, iTunes Store. Lots of great episodes coming up featuring even more insights from some of the thought leaders and some of the leading experts in sales and marketing in B2B. Uh, thanks very much for joining us again today. On behalf of my great producer, Paul, this is Matt Hines. Thanks for joining us again on Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been listening to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio, part of the many shows on the ever-growing Funnel Radio Channel for at-work listeners like you. 